if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, uh, turn with me to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter number 3, and we want to take our reading from there. It's going to be a little bit of reading. But I've had a thought on my heart uh, all week long thinking about um, yesterday's activities on the Okoe and the river, and it's kind of directed my thoughts uh, this week toward Joshua chapter 3 and, and different things that, uh, you know, it's kind of symbolic of the river. And, you know, I thought a lot about life this week, and I, I know one movie says life is like a box of chocolates, right? I think it's a lot more like a river, though. Um, and we want to talk about that today, preach about that today, and, and just draw symbolism uh, from the Word of God and from life and from uh, the river and even experiences on the river. And I appreciate everyone that participated in that yesterday that I was able to sit back and watch uh, while I stayed in the raft. Um, I was able to sit back and watch others add to the sermon today. So we do appreciate it. And one's not here to hear that, uh, that was out. And then there's a lot back there that found all of themselves out of the raft at one time. So we, we might make some mention of that as we go through this. <clears throat> but I want to do something now that I don't guess I've ever done. This is not necessarily a gospel song. It's been a while since I've tried to sing anything in church. Uh, but it's a song that's been on me all week long. Um, it's a country song, and I would dare say probably one of the, in my opinion, best country songs um, that's been written. And it's Garth Brooks' song, The River. So I want to try to sing that right quick. And I just want you to draw parallels and see the symbolism in what we're going to preach today. Before we read, I want to do this. And that's what the, the topic of what the Lord has laid on our heart today. I know in the song it says, a dream is like a river. You can substitute life in there. Uh, and the dreamer, you can substitute each one of us as travelers through this life. Because we all on a journey, ain't we? Every one of us. Yesterday's journey was on the river was, what, five miles, something like that? Took a long time to get there, though. And, you know, the journey can be long, it can seem long, and then it can be short or seem short. Uh, but just draw the, the parallels between them all. You know a dream is like a river, ever changing as it flows. And a dreamer's just a vessel that must follow where it goes. Trying to learn from what's behind you and never knowing what's in store makes each day a constant battle just to stay between the shores. And I will sail my vessel until the river runs dry like a bird upon the wind. These waters are my sky, I'll never reach my destination if I never try. So I will sail my vessel till the river runs dry. Too many times we stand aside and let the water slip away to what we put off till tomorrow has now become today. Don't you sit upon the shoreline and say you're satisfied. Choose to chance the rapids and dare to dance the tide. And I will sail my vessel till the river runs dry. Like a bird upon the wind, these waters are my sky. I'll never reach my destination. If I never try, so I will sail my vessel till the river runs dry. And there's bound to be rough waters, and I know I'll take some falls with the good Lord as my 
captain. I can make it through them all. And I will sail my vessel until the river runs dry. Like a bird upon the wind, these waters are my sky. I'll never reach my destination if I never try. So I will sail my vessel till the river runs dry. Lord, I will sail my vessel till the river runs dry. We're all, as we said, on a journey. so many scriptures. Uh, but I want to look in Joshua this morning. We're going to read and uh, talk about a few things and then probably come back to these scriptures. But it's going to be a little bit of reading here. Uh, but I also thought about Psalm 23, uh, verse number 2. And I'm not going to turn there this morning, but I know Brother Eddie last week preached a little bit about that and I think even read the scripture. But where it talks about, He leadeth me beside the still waters. Uh, so just keep that in mind, and then we want to read here in Joshua chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 14, and read on through chapter 4. It says in verse 14, It came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as they that bear the Ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon the heap very far from the city, Adam, that is beside Zaratan. <clears throat> and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take ye twelve men out of the people, and out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place, where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man, and Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them, the that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan. And as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hastened, hasted and passed over. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over that the ark of the Lord passed over. And the priest in the presence of the people. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh uh, passed over over armed before the children of Israel as Moses spake unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord unto battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him, and they feared Moses, as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony, that they came up out of Jordan, Joshua, 
Therefore commanded the priest, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, that the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up unto the dry land, and the waters of Jordan returned unto their place, and flowed over all his banks, and they as they did before. And the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and encamped in Gilgal, in the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let the, your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that is, it is mighty. That you might fear the Lord your God forever. Bow with me for word of prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Your great grace and your mercy, Lord, which endures forever. Lord, we are thankful today that you make a way where there is no way. Lord, you help us to pass over everything in our life. Lord, you guide us in our life. You give us direction. And Lord, you leave a testimony in each one of us that trust you to leave behind for the generations behind us. Lord God, we just thank you today that you are a powerful God. Lord, that nothing is impossible for you. Lord, that you are above physics even as we know it. Lord, things that are impossible for us are not impossible for you. Lord, that just at the the command of you, these waters would stop from where they were flowing, Lord. And God, I just pray today that as we look at these things that you've put on our heart, that we might focus on you and this journey that we're in of life, Lord, that we know our final destination. We don't know every twist and turn, but Lord, we know as a child of God, where that final destination is, Lord. And Father, we know that we, we will be carried safely over it by you, Lord. We will not be lost down the river of life, but Lord, we will come to the peaceful still waters and we'll rest forever in you. Lord God, I just ask you now, if there's one here that's lost, Lord, really that's drowning right now in that river, Lord. Help them to see your arms outstretched, wanting to rescue them. They would reach up and take it, Lord. And God, I just ask you now that we as the church, though we might not understand trials, situations, and things going on in our life, Lord, help us just to trust our captain. As Father, you know best in every situation. God, forgive me now of my sins, and Lord, just preach your word through me this morning. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. Now, before we get too far in it, uh, I want to say, I want to bring attention to some of the things that happened here uh, that, to me, is pretty profound. And, and even as uh, we have talked a little bit this morning, I uh, wonder how many times our, our trip yesterday has been brought up. Several times I've heard it talked about what happened and, and how we got through it and uh, all the different details of it. And as we look at what God commanded Joshua to do to take them stones up, he told him to take the stones out of the dry river and put them over here to when the children say, what happened here and what does the stones mean? He can say, well, God brought us through this river on dry ground. You see, they were going to tell the story of what happened with them in the river. So I don't want that to get lost, and I want to go ahead and mention that uh, just to bring attention that everything we do in our life is for a testimony, for a legacy that we leave 
behind us. And I'm not going to preach too much on this because I have preached out here that very thing. Uh, but I want you to understand that concept that you leave behind a legacy to those that come after you, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Whether it's for God or whether it's not, we all leave something behind. You might be poor, broke, not have anything to leave anybody. I would probably fall in that category. But I'm going to tell you what I can leave, and that is my testimony, that I'm a child of God, and this ain't my home, and I'm somewhere a lot better off when I pass from this life. Amen? And if my kids don't get anything else, or grandkids, or any of my family don't get anything else from me, I want them to have uh, the knowledge that I am a saved by grace individual, and I'm at home in glory with God right now, when I die. Amen? That's the most important thing. That's that legacy that we leave. But I wanted to look <clears throat> now at the, uh, the river. And for one, can you imagine, you know, the Jordan River really is uh, somewhat the size, maybe a little smaller. Uh, in some places it is, it is smaller. Sometimes it's a little bigger than what we went on yesterday. Uh, not got quite the rapids down through it. But I want you to understand that at this time, it was a time of the rainy season. And all during that, the Jordan River would be flooded. We all know down here what flooding does, right? We've all seen it in Lynchburg. I mean, floods everything out. You can't pass the roads, tears stuff out. And at this time, I want you to understand, this is what they come up to, uh, this river that now was bigger than it normally was. They had a big problem standing in their way. Unless you've got a big God. And when you have a big God, a big problem is not a big problem. We make it a big problem a lot of times instead of trusting the Lord in it. But I want you to understand that fact. This was no little stream. And I want you to, to, to picture in your mind, all of a sudden, this water's flowing hard down through there, and all of a sudden it just stops. It stands up on one side. Dry on this side. And there is no concrete dam there to stop the water. Wouldn't that be something? That would have been a pretty amazing thing to, to see if we was out there yesterday. It would be kind of stunk if we was out there in the you know, middle of the trip. We'd be walking our raft back, right? But you know, God is a powerful God. To be able to do that, that defies nature. That defies physics. That defies what we would recognize as a possibility. God is beyond the realm of what we think is possible. Amen? You've got situations in your life that is impossible to you. God is above the realm of your impossibilities. There is nothing, the Bible says, that is impossible for God. So I just want you to keep that in mind. But as we look at the river. Uh, in the psalm, we, we, we read the line that says, it's ever changing uh, as it flows. You know, that river yesterday, it didn't stay the same. For one foot, it didn't stay the same. It was constantly changing. Is that not the way our lives is? I mean, one minute it's one way, the next minute it's another way. It, it, it's always uh, changing, always evolving, always uh, doing something different. We uh, hardly ever just sitting perfectly still. Even in calm waters, we're moving a little bit, right? Always changing. And I thought about the river, and y'all just have, you know how my mind works, y'all have to bear with me as I, you know, compare life and the river and all the symbolism. Sometimes the river's deep, sometimes it's shallow. You know, that's the way our life is sometimes, too. Sometimes we're deep. And by deep, I, I think we are, we are deep in with God. I mean, we, we are in our relationship with God where we need to be. And you know what happens in deeper water on a river? Deeper water is the calmer water. Isn't it? What happens when it gets shallow? 
It gets rocky. There's some times in our life that we're shallow, ain't we? We don't like to think of ourselves as shallow people, do we? But a lot of times we're shallow. Our faith is shallow. Our faith uh, sees more of the rocks that's under us than the God that's holding us up. We need to be deep with God instead of the shallow. Sometimes a river is calm. Sometimes it is raging. Isn't that our life? Sometimes our life is calm. Sometimes it is absolutely raging. Where you don't know what you're doing. You're just trying to survive. Anybody ever been there? You can, you can raise your hands on that one. If you didn't raise your hand, just hang on. You'll find out soon enough. The calm times are great times. Nice times. Relaxing times. But we wouldn't appreciate those times without the, the, uh, the raging times, would we? Sometimes the river is wide. Sometimes it's narrow. Sometimes we see things in life broadly. Sometimes we see it narrow. We have to know which is the right way at the right time. Amen? Sometimes we see things a lot too wide, widely when it needs to be narrow. Uh, listen, God says that His way is narrow. In other words, there is a truth that He says this is the truth, this is the way to follow it, and it doesn't matter what our opinion is, how wide our opinion might be, if God says it's this way, it's that narrow way. Whether people want to call you narrow-minded or not, Listen, I'd rather be called narrow-minded and be following God's way than be so open-minded, as I heard one say, that all my brains fall out. Amen? And you follow all the ways of the world. It can also, the river can give you thrills, and Brother TJ it can give you spills. <laughs> Isn't life that way? Sometimes it gives you thrills, and all of our little teenage boys back there, sometimes it can give you spills. We all got to enjoy watching that as y'all were flying out of your raft. It would be nice, wouldn't it, if life was always thrills. Always leave you on a, a high, you know. But life just isn't, it just isn't that way. There are spills that come with it. Well, we fall flat on our noses. Or other things. Right? Sometimes the river pulls and sometimes it pushes. Life does us the same way. We're pulled in this direction and when we get pulled this direction it might be the right direction and it might be right up under that log or right up under a, a tree or right into a rock or something like that. Sometimes it pushes us uh, where we don't want to go. Ain't that the way it worked when you jumped out of the boat and you got pushed over here into the slack water and all of a sudden everybody else was 100 yards down the river and poor Shelton was left behind. Sometimes life will just leave you where you don't want to be. But we trust God through them times as well. Sometimes the river is refreshing Sometimes it is treacherous. The water felt good. Brother Terry will agree with me, it felt good. Even though, as I said this morning, it felt good, you know, what when I was in it, it felt good, you know, my hands in her splashing on me. I didn't go in it quite like some of the others in my boat went in it. Uh, I chose to watch from inside the safety of the boat than outside the boat. Uh, but it was refreshing to me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was refreshing to me, but it could also be treacherous, which I think we could. Life is our ways. Life can be refreshing one minute and treacherous the next. Life, uh, the, just like the river, life can be straight, or it can be constantly changing, turning, going this way and that way. It can also be soothing, or it can be scary. Uh, I thought about when uh, we was back at my home church, Riley Creek, and we had a, a we, we did some camping down at the farm along the creek. 
and it's a place that we always like to camp. And I was I was bragging a little bit to uh, one of the ladies at church there. She said, yeah, we'll put our tents right by the creek side. And the creek, just all that, that soothing, I don't know if it does for you, but I love hearing the creek just run over the rocks and that, that uh, babbling, if you would say it, or whatever you'd call it, but the noise it makes going over it. I said, it will just put you out to sleep. We woke up the next morning. She got out of her tent. And her hair was everywhere. She said, I heard that stupid creek all night long. <laughs> See, to me, it was soothing. To her, it was not so much. <laughs> life is kind of that way. Sometimes we're soothed in life, and sometimes life, just to be honest, can be scary and keep us anxious and uh, keep us awake at night. A few more things and we want to get back to the scripture here. And I'll just say this uh, before we go a little bit further. Going back to the song, can any of us just sit on the sidelines and watch life go by? Sometimes we might feel like that. But you're in this life. And we have to make the most of it for God while we're in this life. Amen? God does not call us just to be spectators in life. And I thought about this yesterday as we were going down the river and there's one place uh, to where people will pull off and, and, and watch all the uh, uh, rafters come down the river. And they take pictures. And I think it's actually there where they take pictures, you know, to sell to the ones actually rafting as well. Uh, but there's spectators there. God does not call us to be the spectators on the side of our lives. We are to have an active part in it. Amen? We are not to just take it as it comes, so to speak. But we are to be active in it. Actively following Him. Actively seeking His perfect will. Actively seeking what He wants us to do with our lives, with the life that He gives us. Amen? Now, four more things, and we're going to go back to the Scripture that I thought about. Specifically about our rafting trip yesterday. We went to one part in the river, and you paddle up to this place and you're supposed to do what's called surfing on it where it kind of just keeps you in one place. And I guess if it works, it's pretty neat. But uh, David Lynn didn't think it was quite as neat as the rest of us did. As we got up there to it, he went over the side and it was at a place, called it, he called it a hydraulic to where it would suck you down underneath the water. And I thought, yeah, it might, you know, try to hold you in place, suck you down a little bit, but I didn't think it would be quite like it was because we were, at that time, watching what was happening. And he went overboard, and I mean like that, he was gone. Sucked up under the water, and we all just kind of sit there and like, all right, all right? And it seemed like forever. I'm sure it wasn't just but a few seconds. We talked about this in Sunday school a little bit. But all of a sudden, this paddle popped up. He still wasn't up there. A couple more seconds went by, and there he finally came out. I just couldn't help but think about that analogy with sin in our life. I mean, how quick can sin drag you down? Gone. And how long will it hold you down? We preached on this a few weeks ago. A whole lot longer than you want to stay down. <laughs> you want to get the analogy right? You talk to David Lynn when he gets back from his further vacation. He was, lot, he was down there a whole lot longer than he wanted to be down there. You could tell by the look on his face. I've never seen him real rattled before until then. And he was pretty rattled, wasn't he? When he come up and the guy on the boat caught a hold of him and he was standing then on a rock, which is a whole other analogy there. He just had to 
sit there like that for a while. I'm going to tell you something. Sin will take you and take you down and keep you so much longer. And if you stay down too long, it will do away with you. So I thought that was a pretty good analogy. The next one I thought about. If we do fall out of the boat in the river, the captain knows how to get us back in. The captain knows how to get us back in. Amen? We don't always know how to get ourselves back in. Amen, Sister Janet? I know how to do it. I love it. Yeah. yeah. All everybody else in the raft seen that too. In the other raft. The captain knows how to get you in. And you see, it would be hard to get in the raft on your own. But what's the captain doing? He's reaching down and grabbing you. I won't really want to pull you up. And he <laughs> grabs you and pulls you to safety. Is that not what our God does for us? When we do fall out of sin, or fall out into sin, fall out of the boat into sin, our captain is always ready and reaching out. And as soon as we get close enough to him, he's going to reach down and pull us up. Now what happens if you fight against him? And you keep trying to do it your way. You're not going to get in that boat near as fast as what you would if you just let the captain pull. How many times do we fight against God and He says, I've got this. I want to fix this. Give it all to me. Just yield yourself to me and let me pull you in. Quit struggling and I've got you. God is our captain and if we'll let Him, anytime we fall, He will pick us back up and pull us to safety. The next thing we thought of, When we can't see what lies ahead of us, God does, don't He? I remember one time, I can't remember which one of y'all said it in our boat, but if you look down the river, and I'm not really used to looking down a river and not being able to see water, you know, seeing what comes after something else. And there was one place where you could look down the river and there was just nothing after the drop. You couldn't see it from our perspective. You couldn't see what lied after that. And what made the comment? The river disappeared. And it really did. To our eye. But you know who knew what was down there the whole time? Our captain knew what was down there. Our captain knew exactly what laid on the other side. When we couldn't see it, he could. He knew. Is that not the way God is? When we can't see what is on the other side, when we can't see what is next in our life, who knows what is? My God knows. Then the next thing, our captain won't steer us wrong. You know, when, when I first got on there yesterday, we, we started practicing paddling. Because I'm used to paddling a kayak, and you know, your paddling really steers the boat when you're kayaking. And, and I learned yesterday, after so long in there, and after, you know, I turned around and watched what our guide, or our captain, if you will, was doing. And watching the other boats, our paddling wasn't so much for steering. Yes, I know it does some. But our paddling was for forward or backward thrust. But you know who was steering the whole time? Our captain had his paddle in the back as the rudder steering the boat. And he knew exactly where to take us. He knew exactly what to do to get us to where we needed to go. Now I'll say this. Those in the boat was earthly captains and it didn't always work out for them. Amen. Uh, there were sometimes they didn't get exactly where they wanted to go. 
But it wasn't all the captain's fault. I'm sure it was part of those in the boat's fault, too, fighting against him or whatever, or, you know, just different things. But, you know, we serve a captain of our vessel that don't have steering problems. He knows exactly how to steer and exactly how to point us to where we need to go and exactly how to get us to our final destination. i just be honest, everybody got, as we said a while ago, everybody got to where they were supposed to get in the end. Amen? All of us got home safely in the end. So as we look at the river, I want to look at one final thing, and it goes back to what we read in Joshua, and how those things relate to uh, life, and I know there's probably not a lot of, there's a lot of other analogies you could draw, symbolism you could draw, but one in the Bible that, as we read Joshua, it made me think of another bit of symbolism that is used about a river. Has anybody here ever heard of when we cross death's chilling river? Anybody heard that in the song? We don't have to cross Jordan alone. Y'all ever heard them songs? If you haven't heard them songs, we might need to go back and sing some of them old songs. Now there is nowhere in the scripture that really says that uh, when we die we're going to cross a river. Okay? Physically cross a river. But it is used as symbolism and as an analogy that we all have this one final thing that we have to cross in the end. All of us will meet death at some point in time in our life. And we have to cross that to get to where we want to go. And as I thought about that, these scriptures in Joshua, uh, to me, symbolize so much of their crossing from where they were into where God wanted them to be. Uh, one day, Brother Terry, I'm going to cross from where I am to where God wants me to be as well. Amen? Everyone in here that's trusted the Lord will cross from where they are now to where their final destination to where God wants them to be. And I looked at the symbolism between what was going on with Joshua here and the children of Israel, and that final crossing that we all will do. And I wrote down some of the things that we looked at as far as the symbolism goes. And I want you to realize, uh, and, and go, there's one side over here and one side over here. On this side where the children of Israel were, it was wilderness. Which is desert. We think of wilderness as, you know, trees and, you know, water and creeks and like what we were in yesterday. That's not wilderness most of the time mentioned in the Bible. Uh, it is so much symbolism and also uh, physical truth that wilderness would, what that they're talking about is a desert area. They were in a desert area, dry and mostly barren place. It's why God had to bring water out of the rock for them. It's why God had to bring the manna down. There was just not a lot of other things else for them to drink or to eat there if God didn't provide. You see, they were in the wilderness. They were in the desert. But where did God say, I want to take them to? A land flowing with milk and honey. He said, I want to take you over here to where civilization is. I want to take you over here to a place that's prepared for you. We're in a wilderness right now. But God wants to take us to a place that He's prepared for us. Amen? And I'm going to go on one day to that place. They were on one side wandering. Wandering around. For 40 years they were wandering in this desert without a permanent place. And what did God say was on the other side of the river? Here is your permanent place of growth. Here's where your settlement is. Here's where you're going to live. They were homeless on this side of the Jordan River. On the other side, they had a habitation. They had a place
place where they could call home. They had a place to where uh, they could come to every evening and wake up in every morning. Instead of a tent that today might be here and the next day be over yonder and the next day over there. They could stop their roaming. Listen, we roam around in this life, but one day there's going to come a permanent habitation for each one of us that are children of God. Amen? In that glorious city of God. On this side of the river, there was a promise made. On this side of the river, the other side of the Jordan River, was a promise fulfilled. God said, if you'll follow me, I'm going to take you into the land. And what did they do 40 years earlier? They said, Lord, we want to go to that land, but you know there's giants over there. They're a lot bigger than us, meaner than us, and we can't take them. And what did God say? If you'll trust me, I'm going to fight the battle for you, and I'm going to give you the land that they're in right now. You see, they didn't trust the promise then. Forty years later, the tune got changed. They were tired of wandering. And they said, Lord, we're going to trust you, and I'm going to take the promise now, and we're going to go to where you send us. To where you promised you would take us and give to us. On this side of the river, there was death. On this side of the river, on the other side, Jordan, was life. From the original ones that left Egypt, of the children of Israel, to cross over, there was two adults that made the complete journey. Joshua and Caleb was the ones that made it. They were the only two spies that trusted God and said, I don't care how big them boys are over yonder, we got them because God's got them. And all the rest that did not believe did not get to go to the promised land. Now their offspring did. But the original ones did not. You see, all the others died in the wilderness. There was death there. There was life waiting on the other side of Jordan. On one side of the river, there was hunger. On the other side, there was honey. This side over here, unless they trusted God, they were going to be hungry. Unless they took what God gave them, they were going to be hungry. What did they eat just about every day? Manna. I don't know what manna tastes like. We might get to eat some when we get to heaven. I don't know. But you eat anything for so long, and it's not real good anymore. And that's when they started crying and said, Lord, all we got is this man over here. I want some quail. I want some meat. I want something different. So then God said, okay, let me give you some quail. And what did the Bible say? It said God gave them enough quail to where they eat it, eat it, eat it, till it was coming out their noses. Eat it till they, it made them sick. Put it that way. The Bible's full of some vivid descriptions. Amen. But on the other side, God said, I've got honey, which was symbolic. I'm going to supply all your needs even down to the dessert. Amen. Even down to the sweet stuff. On this side of the river, there was thirst, to where they cried out and called out, God, you brought us out to this wilderness just to let us uh, die of thirst. And that's why I said God had to provide them water out from a rock. But on the other side, where God had promised them, there was springs, there was wells, there was all kinds of water that could quench their thirst. In our life, it's the same way. We are thirst if we're out of God's will. But God says, come into my will and there'll be a spring of water springing up inside of you everlasting life. On that side of the river, there was turmoil. <clears throat> On that side of the river, there was victory. It's a big difference, isn't it? God wants to give each one of us victory. When we don't trust Him, we live in turmoil. When we trust Him, though, we live in victory. Even if it doesn't appear to be victory from everybody that's watching, you can be 
be going through some bad circumstances and still live in victory because you're trusting God. Amen? Turmoil on this side, victory on the other. The last one I got, there was the old life on this side. There was the new life on this side. All those negative things that was on this side. He said, you can cross the Jordan River and you leave that behind. And I've got a new life prepared for you so long as you trust me. Now, did they always trust him? No. It's one reason, like I said, God said stack them stones up to where when people ask, they come back and remember how I took care of them and remember what I've done for them. In our life, when we get saved, we pass from this old life that we had to the new life that God has prepared for us. And so long as we live in His will, trust in Him, things may not always go great. But when we trust Him, we understand God's in control of it. And it's all going to work out all right. And we have this new life in Him. You see, we always don't do that, do we? Sometimes we try to go back to our old ways. Does that ever work out for you, by the way? Has it ever? No, never has, never will. Because God wants something better for each one of us. He wants us to live in victory. Now, going back here. I talked about a while ago, and we're going to be closing in just a, a couple minutes. The children of Israel had a problem when they came to the Jordan River, didn't they? They couldn't make a bridge. They couldn't swim good enough. They could not get over that river on their own. Could not get over it on their own. It had to take the divine intervention of God. Had to take God stepping in and doing something miraculous for them to be able to cross over to where God wanted them. How many of us can get to heaven on our own? Hmm, no hands went up. That's good. We just can't do it. We cannot get to heaven because of our own wills, because that we try hard enough or do uh, mainly the right things that we think is right, we can't physically possibly do it. We can't spiritually do it. There's no way we can do it. It took God stepping in and doing something absolutely miraculous. What did He do? He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth in the form of mankind to live a perfect life than to give Himself willingly, yielding to the Father's will and going to a cross of punishment, of judgment, not for Himself, but for each one of us for our sins. And that is a miraculous thing that someone that could at any time speak and the angels would deliver him from it. But yet, he stayed the course and he did that because he knew he didn't stand a chance any other way. He had to go to the cross. He had to give his life. But it doesn't stop there. As miraculous as it would have been to see the Jordan River all of a sudden just the walls, or the water, just make walls and stand up straight. Even though you know there's a lot more water supposed to be coming down through there. But everything just kind of was put on pause. As miraculous as that was, Jesus laying down His life, and then three days later, picking it back up again was even more miraculous. Because He lives, brothers and sisters, we live also. Because He lives, lost friend in here, He wants to give you life as well. 
You have a captain of your soul. You have fallen out of the boat, lost friend. And you are drowning right now. And I want you to understand, the captain of the vessel, the captain of the boat, is standing here with arms open, reaching down, wanting you to reach up. Wanting you to get close to Him and just yield yourself to Him so that He can rescue you. How long will you fight against Him? How long will you swim the other way? Try to swim to where you know best. They talked about in Sunday school years ago before the church group went then. A few days before that, a man actually drowned on the river up there. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, if I don't remember exactly like y'all said, but I believe he was kayaking, wasn't he? He was kayaking down through there and fell out of his boat. And there was people around him to save him. But instead of taking their help, they were throwing ropes to him. He was proud in his own heart and said, that's all right, I've got this. He kept trying to stand up. To gain his own footing. To save himself. And you know what happened? The very thing that they warned us, first thing, happened to him. They said, whatever you do, don't try to stand up because your foot can get wedged in the rocks down there and you'll drown. You'll be there. And they said that's what happened to him. His foot wedged and whatever they tried, they could not get him out. Lost friend, do not try to stand up on your own. You'll get wedged and you'll drown. Take the lifeline that God's throwing you. Look at the captain of the vessel. He wants to save you. He wants to pull you on board where there is safety and security. Why will you keep struggling yourself? Why will you keep fighting against the one that's trying to save you? Why would you keep trying to do it on your own when there's no possible way you'll ever stand up on that rock? We're going to have a verse of song. If you're here today and you're lost, I pray that you would come and be saved right now. Come and cry out to Him. Come and ask Him to save your soul. Look to the captain.